Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Isabel Buscaro Clark. Um, welcome to this uh, symposium. Um, we have uh, this morning with us a range of scientists and uh, uh, senior uh, leaders. Uh, some of uh, some of them are coming in pre-recorded format, uh, but we'll have an opportunity to have uh, question and answers uh, towards the, the back end and have a good discussion with the audience, hopefully. Uh, so my name is Isabel Buscaro clark I head the communications, the engagement work and the impact work for Diamond Light Source, the UK national uh, synchrotron. And um, I'm also representing this morning um, Expands and Panosk, uh, which are two uh, EU uh, grants uh, that have been funded to lay the foundations for open data at photon and neutron uh, sources um, that are that have been participating in in those uh, in those grants. Um, so uh, this session on open data for healthier societies, uh, a virtuous cycle, is uh, very much rooted in uh, the engagement work that has been taking place with these two grants. So welcome everybody. We've got three, as I mentioned earlier, pre-recorded sessions. Um, the first one will be uh, with Dr. Ben Perry. The second one will be with Dr. Uh, Claire Walsh, and the third Third one with uh, Dr. Sam Horrell, um, followed by a question and answer sessions with Professor Andrew Harrison. Um, Professor Andrew Harrison is the current CEO of uh, Diamond Light Source in the UK. He's also part of the League uh, for the European uh, Accelerator Based Photon. Uh, sources uh, called LEAPS um, and he will be telling us a little bit about the importance of working together at uh, the European level and uh, will give us a, a feel for what the, the challenges are uh, for these uh, large-scale facilities. But uh, without delay, we'll start off uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, ben Perry, um, who is a medicinal um, chemist. He's got over 15 years experience in conducting early stage uh, drug design. Um, he's got a variety of um, experiences ranging from having been at uh, academic uh, universities, uh, doing research positions, all the way through to biotech companies, that have uh, really delivered um, early drug design and drug discovery. So we've got um, uh, we've got him. He's uh, specialized in in particular later on in uh, the area of chemoinformatic and computational uh, tools. Um, that kind of looks at how data is being used in the drug discovery in, in particular. And Ben, um, just to, to finish off in terms of his credential, um, he's got a master's degree in chemistry from uh, the University of uh, uh, Wales in, uh, from Swansea and the, an executive MBA uh, from a business school and a PhD from Imperial College London. So let's start off uh, with the recording uh, of Ben Perry and then we'll switch on to our next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak about the COVID-19 moonshot and our efforts in the open science space. Uh, I'm Ben Perry. I work for the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative based in Geneva, Switzerland. Unfortunately, I'm not available um, this morning to, to speak to everyone, so I've uh, had to pre-record this. <laughs> Apologies for not being there in person, but my email is available from uh, the session chairs and I'm happy to take any questions by email after the fact. So well, let me start by sharing my screen. Let's see, and then I'll tell you all about the COVID moonshot. So the COVID moonshot is an open science global collaboration that's looking for therapeutics, new therapeutics for treating COVID-19. Um, interestingly, this is an open science project that was not started by DNDI. In fact, we joined three or four months after it had started in the true spirit of open science, which I think is quite interesting. Um, it's a huge multinational effort um, involving partners in academia, partners in industry, partners across the globe, um, coming together to think about how we can use open science to pioneer a global equitable access approach to new therapeutics. So this is new drugs for treating COVID-19 as quickly as possible in a way that everyone can use them. Um, and that they're available immediately to everyone. Um, thank, this is currently funded by the Wellcome Trust and the COVID-19 Therapeutics Accelerator. I'll talk a little bit about the history of this project. It was initiated by some of the names you can see here. Right now it's led by DNDI along with the rest of the consortium and as I said, funded. 
by uh, Wellcome Trust. Uh, and the goal currently with the current funding is to have a molecule, a new treatment that's ready for evaluation in phase one clinical trials uh, as soon as possible and that can then be tested in advanced clinical trials against COVID-19 patients and hopefully become available to everyone. And interestingly, this is an open science initiative and therefore has no patent protection. And I'll talk a little bit at the end about how we have dealt with uh, the no patent protection question. So a little bit about the science. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but basically we're looking for new chemicals, which can become drugs that inhibit what's called the main protease of SARS-CoV-2. So this is uh, finding molecules, finding new, new, new chemical compounds that have never existed before, designing them to stop a particular part of the viral machinery from working. The viral machinery is called the main protease. Here's a blobby representation of it. Um, and if we can find chemicals that stop this from working, it'll shut down the way that the virus replicates. And therefore, when someone is infected with the virus, they can take the drug that does this. It stops the virus from working. And ideally, they have less and less viral virus available. The virus can't replicate and they clear it, clear it quickly and with fewer um, symptoms. So uh, you know, a, a low, lower impact of the virus uh, on the immune response. How do we find those chemicals? Well, it's quite complex. I'm going to skip over how, exactly how that's done, but basically it involves, at least at the, at the beginning, the team at the Diamond Light Source in Oxfordshire, um, and the team at the Weizmann Institute in Israel working together to find what we call chemical starting points. They found chemicals that look like they may be able to inhibit the protein. They started to maybe interact with the protein, block the protein, gum up the protein in a particular way. And the team at Diamond found them and the team at, team at Weizmann are able to show that it actually works and stops the protein from working. And they took their initial results you can see here a timeline coming from early February was when the team in Diamond started working on this. They started to get what we call the, the first crystals, so the first pictures of what this protein looks like. They come about through X-ray through X-ray crystallography screening that's done at the light source and requires a synchrotron. And then they're able to throw different chemicals at them in the same experiment and see how those chemicals stick to the protein. And they started to find those results and find chemicals that could stick in the point in the, at the point that we wanted them to stick. And then they started putting them out into the public domain and releasing that. So that um, uh, is around about this point here in early March. Um, and normally when you have this information in a drug discovery project, this is when your chemists would come into the room and you'd share this information. Look, we found these molecules, these new chemicals can stick to the protein. How do we make them more sticky? How do we make them stick to this protein um, more rigorously? How do we make sure they don't stick to other, other things because that could cause toxicology? And this is what chemists are experts at doing. Unfortunately, or fortunately for the moonshot, there was a big lockdown at this point. And so instead of doing that with the internal chemists, they sent out a tweet. So near London at the Weizmann sent out a tweet saying, we've got all of these structures of fragments, which are these small molecules bound to the, to the, um, to the protein. We've got the pictures. This is what they look like. We want ideas on what we need to make next. And so they put this out into the Twitter sphere and very quickly, many people started to reply, including me. Um, so I came across this just browsing uh, my uh, my Twitter feed and thought, oh, that's a neat idea. Let's see how that's working. And they had a website that had been built for people to see the data and for people to share ideas. And this was something I was very interested in because I'd been trying to do something similar, certainly nowhere near successfully uh, for some of our DNDI projects. Uh, and there are some interesting papers that have been put out in Nature Communications and Nature that talk about how this works. Um, here are the links. Um, I'm sure we can share those later, but this tells the, the, the early story. But what's important is that from this tweet, very quickly, because of the perfect storm of a lockdown, people sitting at home, people thinking, scientists thinking, well, how can I help impact this pandemic? Um, you know, I, I come from the neglected tropical disease background, so I work in parasites. I have no idea how I can help on viruses, but maybe there's a way I can contribute. And thankfully, many other people thought the same thing. A huge international consortium came together online to be able to drive this project forward, led by the names you can see here at different places. So um, experts in medicinal chemistry, such as Ed Griffin at Medchemica, experts in preclinical sciences, such as Annette at the University of Oxford, Nia, I've already mentioned at the Weizmann, contributors from MSK in New York, who are experts in computational design. Um, 
And thankfully, the chemists at Enamine in Kyiv in Ukraine, who were able to actually make some of the molecules we were designing so that we could test them at the Weizmann Institute and at the University of Oxford. And this, from almost nothing, this huge consortium of open science took shape and started working together um, day after day, trying to move this project forward, trying to take this really high quality data that Frank and Mia had come up with uh, at the beginning and try to create a drug discovery project out of it. And it was able to move very, very quickly because of uh, the open science approach, because they were able to attract a global team, partly because of the lockdown, hundreds of years of experience, mainly from big pharma, able to come in and tell them what, what should and shouldn't do. And also luckily access to the kinds of labs that we needed to do this antiviral work. So this is this maybe some of the uh, technical chemistry, but this shows how things have evolved. So here you can see a structure of some of the early molecules. These are the molecules sticking to the protein. The protein is the skin is the, the is made up of the skinnier lines you can see in the background, and these thicker lines are the chemicals that they found that bound. And here are what they look like in chemical representation. So this data was put into the public domain in 2020, and quite rapidly through open source efforts, we started to get designs coming through that actually work. So we were able to take these that are very weak binders; they stick to the protein to some extent, but certainly not strongly enough to prevent it from working. Um, and then eventually we were able to start to get molecules that could stop the, stop the protein from working. You can see here, this is the concentration of material, 24 micromolar, concentration of this chemical that's required to stop the protein from the main protease protein from working. This is quite a high concentration, but it's certainly interesting enough to say this is definitely doing its job. It's getting in there and it's stopping the enzyme from working. And this was done in the public domain. This was designed because of the public domain and others then saw this data and were able to elaborate on it. So, you know, you can see the chemical representation of this compound. We add a little bit more, add a few more oxygens and carbons. And now all of a sudden we get a much lower concentration required to inhibit it. This is low enough that we can actually show that this molecule doesn't just stop the protein from working, but if you put this in the presence of a virus, it kills the virus, which is really, really important. And then we can make more tweaks to it, more changes, and we can start to see that we make molecules that are able to kill the virus, even at low concentration, in fact, incredibly low concentrations for this molecule. And importantly, these are molecules that if you give them orally to a rodent, for example, a rat, it gets into their bloodstream, it spreads throughout their system and is able to get where it needs to go. If we're thinking about having to, this is a drug that has to be given orally to someone who has been infected. The drug needs to be able to be given orally, get across the gut wall, through the liver, out into the, uh, out into the bloodstreams to go and tackle the virus. And these all designs that came from external open science efforts. And this is a molecule that's able to do that. And then rapidly, we've been able to get through to three really, really beautiful, interesting looking molecules. And luckily at this point, early around about here, uh, this is July, 2021, the Wellcome Trust gave us funding to actually be able to do this and awarded us an just over 8 million pound grant to be able to, to take this molecule, work on, work on getting the best molecules we can and then profile them to get them ready to go first in human. And that's what we're currently doing. And this is what that looks like. So we have the first phase, which is the design, what we call the hit generation and the lead optimization that finished in February, 2022. And then we started doing all the preclinical work. This, this is where we have to manufacture on large scale and work out how to make it on large scale and work out how to test it and test it in different um, toxicology studies, make sure that it isn't toxic, make sure that it doesn't have a um, imp negative impact on heart rate, negative impact on the liver, all of these different things. Very, very complex work. We've currently got three molecules. We're about to cut that down to two best. And then at the start of 2023, we'll have narrowed down to just a single molecule that's our preclinical candidate. And then eventually we'll have a regulatory dossier ready to convince the authorities we have enough information about this one molecule to, to administer it, to start to check its behavior in healthy human volunteers, a phase one study. So that's where we are right now. Now, from an open science perspective, this is quite interesting. This first part is very amenable to open science. It benefits enormously from open science, as I showed on the earlier slides, and it's quite easy to share this data. Um, the only negative impact of sharing all this data is that, that we can't take a patent because the data is in the public domain, and so it's uh, prior art. You can't uh, necessarily take a patent. 
This part here is a lot more complex to share from an open science perspective. We can release some, some information on what we're doing, but it's actually um, not that amenable to being shared in real time. Uh, the first thing is it's incredibly expensive and so we have donors that have given us money to be able to do this and we need to therefore to make sure we do it right and we minimize risks and unfortunately there are risks posed by sharing this data and sharing in fact the identity of those three molecules completely openly because if we were to share those three molecules completely openly it would allow anyone to take those molecules and work on them which is a benefit of open science however unfettered, uncontrolled access to those molecules and contributions, even with all the will in the world positive intention, can pose a major existential threat. We need to, be, need to make sure that any experiments that are done with these molecules are very tightly controlled and rigorously designed because any data that is generated by anyone anywhere will be assessed by the regulatory authorities. And what we do not want to do is have a rogue experiment, perhaps maybe not perfectly, uh, not, not well designed, or perfectly run or run at a quality that we cannot control negatively impact what could be a huge uh, a, mo a, a, a molecule or a drug of huge importance to, to, to the global community. So because we have funding coming from our donors, we have to make sure that we can control this and that therefore makes this not necessarily uh, uh, applicable to open science. And the other part of this that's frustrating from an open science perspective is that the more that we disclose about these molecules, the less likely we are to be able to eventually get this all the way to patient. And this is maybe uh, the, the, the key crux of the open science for drug discovery argument, which is this. What we have here is a process that will finishes here, the fa phase one ready status. At that point, we have to start doing clinical trials and we have to start thinking about how we manufacture this molecule on a scale that allows it to be used as a medicine, which means building factories, which means training people to run those factories. Um, it is an incredibly expensive and incredibly complex process. And when I say incredibly expensive, we are talking in the many tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, it is also very, very high risk. Only one in 10 projects that goes through that process in the pharmaceutical industry succeeds. The other nine fail for different reasons. So it's you're thinking if you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars per start per, per project and most of those are going to fail, this is an expensive process. And it also takes a long time and requires an, an, a level of expertise and know-how that is almost exclusively the domain of pharmaceutical companies. So to do this with a non -ch novel chemical entity, NCE, pretty much the only people who do this in any drug for any sort of drug discovery, any drug R and D are pharmaceutical companies. Trying to do this outside of a pharma company is very, very tricky because you need to find someone who's prepared to give the money and provide the expertise to do this. And it's generally not available. DNDI have exp expertise in doing that, but usually in collaboration with pharma companies uh, or in collaboration with partners who can provide the money. If we could provide, convince a pharmaceutical company to take our molecule at this point, it would be fantastic. It could be accelerated through their process. Because it's COVID, it would probably be a lot shorter than six to 10 years. We could maybe do this in, a, in uh, as short as a year. If you look at Pfizer, have achieved that internally with their own internal program. The problem is that very clearly, pharmaceutical companies will not take a risk on a product for which they don't have an IP control. The molecule is in the public domain. Anyone can work on it. The pharmaceutical company is not going to invest its resource on a project that could be torpedoed by others or over which they cannot control uh, the eventual commercial use. And so this is the IP conundrum that we have to deal with. How do we deal with the IP that enables the development and the open science that we're using early on? And we're thinking about how we can do this. And we have a strategy team that are thinking about this at DNDI and within the Moonshot. Can we get enough global health funding to do this? Are there generic pharmaceutical companies, generic manufacturers that can help us with the manufacturing capacity? Are there clinical programs sponsored by governments that could provide the clinical capacity? And can we bring all these different pieces together to construct a consortium that can mimic the way a pharmaceutical company would do this? We don't have the answer for that, unfortunately, but we are working daily on trying to answer that right now. Um, and we hope to have that answer quite soon. And um, part of our motivation is not just the moonshot and COVID-19, but it's that the COVID moonshot team have been recently awarded 
a um, funding from the US government, the National Institutes of Health, and NIAID, uh, over $70 million to use this consortium approach um, <clears throat> to repeat this process that we've achieved on the moonshot and take it all the way through for other viruses and other viruses of pandemic, pandemic concern. Um, so other coronaviruses such as MERS, looking at uh, other viruses that could become pandemics in the future and use the same open science approach we've used so far for the moonshot to deliver this uh, similar projects that can be uh, investigated for future emerging pathogens. So clearly this speaks to the success of the open science approach taken by the moonshot. It works. We need to think a little bit more about how we manage the intellectual property approach. But our, our intention is to repeat this open science approach, put as much data into the public domain as possible without compromising those downstream developments. And this is a center that started life uh, last month after having received the funding. So that's my last slide. I hope that that's been useful. Thank you very much for the, your, your time. And thank you, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you about this. So very big thank you to Ben for um, this uh, great presentation and how really is uh, is really making the case for that early open science, uh, but also re representing the challenges that are posed uh, by that approach. Um, so thank you very much. We'll move on to uh, next uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Claire Walsh. Um, Claire is a senior postdoctoral research fellow at uh, the um, at UCL in, in London. Um, she's at the Center of uh, for Advanced uh, Biomedical uh, Imaging and the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Um, Claire's academic career started at the University of Bristol, where she received a first in uh, physics and philosophy at the time, and then she developed an interest in biophysics. Um, Claire then joined UCL um, uh, Doctoral Training Center, and she went on and did a, a, a PhD in uh, materials and tissues um, at, the, at the materials and tissues department. Um, her PhD has focused on in vitro and in silico uh, models to study uh, bubbles dynamics in human tissues um, and basically the cause of decompression sickness uh, in scuba divers. So very interesting work. In 2020, Claire um, uh, became part of an international team led by Dr. Peter Lee. Um, that uh, looked at uh, organs that had been um, affected by COVID, uh, namely uh, lung, um, lung samples there. And uh, they used the extremely uh, bright uh, light source uh, that has now uh, been the upgrade of the European light source in Grenoble um, to actually develop an imaging technique that is very particular in the face contrast um, uh, the tomography side and and Claire's going to tell us a, a lot more about this uh, in just a minute and they've been able to obviously map out um, these um, uh, samples at very high resolutions and uh, they are working on a wider uh, range of activities as you will hear in just a minute so uh, without delay we'll look at Dr Claire Walsh's video um, and pre-record Hi, good morning everybody. My name is Claire Walsh. I'm an imaging scientist from UCL working on a collaborative project with the ESRF called the Human Organ Atlas or the HOA. Today I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about the project, the data it's generating and the ways in which we're making uh, the data fair. Let's begin with a little bit of background on the problem. So in 2020, we all know what was going on. The COVID-19 pandemic was in full flow. And there are two uh, medics from Germany, Dr. Max Ackermann and Dr. Danny Yonick, who were trying to understand how this disease was impacting the lung microstructure in the patients that they were treating. Danny and Max got in contact with Professor Peter Lee from University College London and asked him if he knew of imaging techniques that could help image this damage in 3D with more context more spatial context about the lung. Professor Peter Lee has worked with uh, synchrotron and x-ray imaging for many, many years, and he knew that the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility had just recently finished its upgrade to being the first fourth generation source in the world. So Peter Lee contacted Paul Taffaro, who's the beamline scientist of one of the beamlines on e at ESRF, BM18, and asked him if he would be able to help. So what came out of this was a technique. The technique is called HIP-CT. 
hierarchical phase contrast tomography. Now, HIP-CT is a propagation-based phase contrast local tomography technique. Uh, don't worry if you don't understand all of that. Essentially, we generate contrast in our imaging technique by having faint density differences in the sample, which create refractive ind indice changes, and these are the basis of our contrast mechanism. What HIP-CT allows us to do is to image whole intact human organs without sectioning them, and then to zoom in to regions of interest anywhere within the organ and scan these at high resolution. So we normally scan at three tiny levels of resolution. We have our whole organ at about 25 micrometers per voxel. We then scan a region of interest at sort of a middling resolution, which is about six micrometers per voxel. And then we go to high resolution, 2.5, one to 2.5 micrometers per resolution. And at with this protocol, we've shown previously that we can reach single cell resolution in inside an intact human brain. So to do this, firstly, there's some sample preparation here. We This is an ex vivo technique, so we're taking um, samples from organ donors, we're fixing them and we're preparing them for scanning. We're then performing our scanning. The scanning looks a little bit like this. So there you'll see a sample, a brain sample. It's being rotated, it's being uh, scanned tomographically for the whole brain. We then select regions of interest within that organ to scan. So what this ends up looking like is a bit of this. So here, this is a data set of a COVID-19 lung lobe um, imaged by one of my uh, colleagues, Joseph Brunet. Uh, inside it, you can see the yellow and the green regions of interest. Those are our medium and our high resolution. These data sets are 3D, so you can see us here scanning through that data set. You can see the green region here, that higher resolution. You see how the data sets are perfectly registered to one another. You can see some of the damage in the lung. And here we're transitioning to that high resolution region of interest, the 2.5 micrometer. Um, uh, when, it, when this pauses, you're able to see some small flecks in places. Um, we think these are individual um, cells. As we zoom back out, you see that you retain that hot context of the whole organ. And we can take as many of these regions of interest as we want. There are some, some caps on that, but we can take a lot of these different regions of interest within the entire organ. So what we have then is a technique that allows us to, to do this multi-resolution imaging across intact human organs. And what we realized very quickly was that we could apply this to the whole range of human organs. So we image at three resolutions. Our final images are all compressed in JPEG 2000, which is about a 10 times compression, but still we end up with these very, very large data sets. So our whole organs at our 25 micrometers are anywhere between five to 80 gigabytes. That's with the 10 times compression. We can have these medium uh, resolution regions of interest, 20 to 100, and we can have the high resolution regions of interest, one to two micrometers, go anywhere up to 150 gig, depending on how long a column of we want to image. And as I showed you, we can have multiple of these regions. So it's very easy, as you can imagine, to quickly get a multi-resolution data set of an organ that's larger than uh, 1.5 terabytes. So it was a real challenge for us as to how we share this data, interact with this data um, with our collaborators. The project as a whole currently stands, we have over 23 um, institutions and 50 active collaborations worldwide, and this is growing every day and you can see here some of the different um the different groups that we collaborate with around the world um and this creates a challenge you know trying to uh move this data is difficult trying to ensure collaborators have access to the levels of of data they want and can interact with it in meaningful ways so we also consider the fact that we, we don't just have one type of collaborator we have many different types so we have a lot of the medics who we collaborate with image analysis, analysts, biologists, medical illustrators, biophysicists, engineers, and all these people want to access and understand the data in slightly different ways, and will have different resources um, available to them in terms of being able to handle the data and interact with it. So what we really wanted was to create a way that all our collaborators, but also anybody worldwide, could download this data and interact with it in, in as many meaningful ways as possible. So the project, in order to do this, we developed uh, with the PANOSC team from ESRF, the Human Organ Atlas. So it can be accessed at this website. And I'm gonna do a little video demo of this now.
So here we have the Human Organ Atlas, and if I just uh, go into there, humanorganatlas at esrf.eu, uh, you'll see the front splash page that we have here, so this just gives you a general overview. Um, with our affiliations, a video of the brain, and a few other bits and pieces, I'm going to show you around it a little bit. So if we go up to the top here, we have the three tabs, Explore, Search, and Help. If I go into the Explore tab, you'll see how the, uh, it's arranged. So firstly, we're arranged by patient or donor. Each of these represents a different patient from which um, we have samples. So if you click on one of them, you see the different organs that we have imaged, and you also get a bit of description about that patient. Uh, if I click on one of the others, you can see in this patient we just have the left lung. Here we have the brain and the kidney. If I go back to this patient and we look at one of the actual organ data sets. So if I click on that data set, um, on that organ, sorry, it shows all the data sets for that particular organ, so all those different resolutions. So here you can see we have quite a lot of data sets, some at the middle resolution, some at the lower resolution. For almost every organ, we always have a complete organ overview at that 25 micrometer data sets. So if I just look through the descriptions of the um, data sets here, you'll be able to find the one that says complete organ there. If I click on it, it takes us into the actual data set. So here we have on the right hand side just overview images to help people orient and understand. Sometimes there's videos. We also then have the description um, of the data set. We have that description about the patient as well. We have descriptions about the samples. And here we have all the scan parameters um, for the image acquisition. And at the bottom, all the parameters for the processing. On the right hand side, you have here the actual data sets that you can download. We provide them at different levels of binning um, to help people who don't have as much uh, capacity for the full data sets. You can also download the metadata as a, a text file if you want. We also support at the very top there, you can see that you could download the files with Globus. Um, this is really useful for those who can access it for a more robust, faster download. Um, the other thing that we implemented was this search tab, which is quite cool. Um, what it allows you to do, um, you can scroll through and search the data in various ways. So for instance, here, I'm searching via age or sex. Um, you can imagine as the, as the human organ atlas grows, how useful this kind of searchability will become if you want to only analyze specific portions of the data. You can also do this based on the scan parameters. So potentially for those who are more interested from the image acquisition, image analysis side of things, we have various scan parameters that you can filter the data by. Uh, and then we also have um, this quite uh, cool bit in the middle whereby you can search by pathology. So for instance, if I type in uh, COVID into here, it will pop up all our data sets that are associated with patients um, who had COVID. Um, we can also search for different diseases. Already in the database, we have quite a few things. So diabetes, for instance. Um, there's some organs uh, there. If I click into one of these, this is the kidney, for instance, of uh, a patient with diabetes. Um, if I go back to the search again, um, can look for other things, something like cancer. So you can see as we get more and more um, types of pathology into the organ atlas, how useful this will become. We have, of course, a help tab just to, to help people uh, navigate around the organ atlas. That was the human organ atlas. Um, and you can see how powerful it is. We're also uh, doing a lot of um, exciting new things in the future. So we're going to be adding a lot more data to the Organ Atlas. Watch this space. Um, we're going to be uh, trying to decide how to get better representations of the fully registered multi-resolution data sets and to do more automation of our metadata creation and our data ingestion just to be able to avoid any potential errors. The other thing that I'm excited to preview and show you guys today is that we are using um, interactive, we're developing a, a web browser interactive cloud. So it's based on Neuroglancer. So this here is just one of our data sets. Um, and the Neuroglancer interface uh, allows 3D visualization through uh, cloud stored data. So anybody can access this. We can also add annotations onto this. So here you can just see me adding some annotations for, I don't know, a blood clot or something like this. And you can add a uh, three dimensional and different shapes as your annotations. So this is really particularly powerful for a lot of our medical collaborators who perhaps don't have the um, infrastructure, the computational infrastructure to download and deal with these data sets. But nonetheless, it's incredibly important for our project that we get that interaction on the data set. So like this, without downloading the data just with any web browser, you can do this on a smartphone as well. You can go to the data, interact with the data, 
mark it up for us and we can have interactions with people like this. Um, so it's a really um, exciting new avenue that we're, we're keen and excited to, to develop further. So just to say that all the, the videos and methods and the data, obviously, are publicly available. We have a YouTube channel as well for looking at some of these data, the Human Organ Atlas, and we have our website. Um, and I just want to say a massive thank you to, to the whole team working on this project. It's a huge collaboratory effort, um, and we couldn't have done it without them. So thank you. Brilliant from um, Claire, uh, an amazing catalogue and all this really thanks to quite a number of uh, sources of support uh, amongst which is, is Panosk that really has made uh, the project um, happen uh, over the past uh, over the past uh, year or so. So um, next we're going to move on to our third uh, pre-recorded uh, speaker um, and uh, we will hear a little bit about uh, pandemic preparedness again in a slightly different way and um, this time we've got uh, Dr. Sam Horrell um, who's from the University uh, of Leicester initially that's where he started his degree in medical biochemistry and then he moved up to the University of Liverpool uh, as a joint uh, Diamond and University of, of Liverpool PhD students. Um, he worked on the development of uh, long wavelength uh, phase, phasing experiments and he developed multiple uh, structure from one particular kind of technique which is a one crystal technique and he'll um, yeah he, he's been very successful at, at that. He has also uh, worked for the How Group um, in um, at the University of uh, Essex, and he's also uh, spent a lot of time developing uh, instruments in Hamburg as part of his time at the Pearson's lab there. Sam joined Diamond uh, back in, I believe, uh, 2019, and he uh, has concentrated on the development of serial crystallography, uh, both in synchrotron environments, but also at free electron lasers. And as you will hear, Sam will tell us a little bit about the protein data bank in this uh, upcoming video. And he will um, highlight uh, the work that's been done on the global stage to improve it uh, during uh, the pandemic. Uh, so without delay, let's have a look at uh, Dr. Sam Horrell's presentation. Uh, so hello, uh, my name is Sam Horrell. Uh, I'm a, a beamline scientist at Diamond, uh, beamline I-24 at Diamond Light Source. Um, and I'm also a member of the Coronavirus Structural Task Force, uh, which I'm here to talk to you about today. So the Coronavirus Structural Task Force uh, is a, a group of method developers uh, working in the field of structural biology. So we are specialists in uh, solving structures, processing data, uh, assessing the quality of uh, molecular models that come out of various structural biology techniques. Uh, we are, so what we're doing as a task force is we, we aimed to uh, evaluate the published structures from SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, as well as a couple of selected human interaction partners. Uh, and the idea of this is to provide uh, downstream users with the, the best possible quality models for their uh, sort of follow-on drug design work or whatever it is they're doing with these SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-CoV structures that are being published, uh, especially as they, they were being published at such a rapid rate um, that it was difficult to keep up with which was the the best model to be using for whichever uh, follow-on study. Um, so yeah, so we've been uh, manually and both automatically reprocessing uh, and remodeling uh, the structures and if we can get our hands on it, the raw data that has uh, led to those structures. Uh, we've also been aiming to consolidate and disseminate uh, the structural knowledge around SARS-CoV-2. So uh, over the past half a year, we've been uh, writing uh, reviews, uh, a series of reviews in uh, crystallography reviews, each one doing a deep dive on a single protein uh, involved in the SARS-CoV-2 life cycle in some way. 
uh, the first of which has just been published, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, we've also been uh, publishing uh, uh, blog articles on our, in, on our website inside corona.net with the idea of both informing scientists and the general public around what's happening in SARS-CoV-2 research, uh, generally with a structural uh, slant to it. Uh, we're also looking to find uh, important open questions. And as I said, uh, public outreach has been sort of a key uh, motivator in a lot, of our, a lot of the work that we've done as a task force. So as I said, there's quite a lot of us. So we are 26 people from nine different countries who have been working to check and improve the molecular structures of SARS and SARS-CoV-2 proteins. Uh, so this was all set up by uh, Andrea Thorne uh, and then yeah, everything from uh, PIs uh, to sort of students and even one even one cactus has been involved in the task force. Uh, that's not to say we've done all of this alone. Uh, we've also had a number of partners uh, who have who have worked with us, uh, including the three D BioNotes BioNotes people, uh, the Jedi, uh, CCP four EM, Protopedia, Autodoc, Mol SSI as well as PDB Redo, Mole Probity, and Folding at Homes, Folding at Home, uh, as well as a number of uh, individual labs who have been, been very helpful throughout. So it's a fairly, fairly big undertaking and for the most part, um, I guess, voluntary for lack of a better word. Uh, I joined the task force while still on a, on a postdoc position at Diamond. And obviously during the lockdowns, a lot of stuff shut down. Um, so yeah, it uh, all sort of came together over over the first six months of the of the pandemic. So, where do all of these SARS-CoV-2 molecular structures come from? So, there'll always be some sort of uh, biological preparation to start. Uh, typically, this will be growing your uh, well, producing your protein in some sort of genetically modified bacteria, typically E. coli. Uh, once you've got your purified protein, uh, depending on what type of data measurement you're planning to do, so with NMR, you'll grow your protein with some sort of heavy atoms. Uh, Cryo-EM, uh, you kind of just have to get it quite pure. Um, crystallography, obviously, you'll have to produce a protein crystal from your purified uh, protein. And then once you've got your sample ready, done the data measurement, uh, you then move on to your model, which you'll, which I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail in a second about that. Once you've got your model, you can hopefully answer your biological question, although not always. Sometimes it just leads to more biological questions. Uh, but alongside this, um, once your model is deposited into the protein data bank, uh, it's just publicly available for anyone to download and use for any other downstream methods. So. This was kind of the concern uh, with the, that the task force initially hoped to address that uh, any downstream user can come and pick a model at random. Like if you if you now Google, or if you now look, search for MPRO, the main protease of SARS-CoV-2 in the protein data bank, you get hundreds of models. Uh, which one do you pick? Um, and obviously it's beyond a, someone who's not a structural biologist possibly to actually truly assess which of these models is the best one to use. So we hope to be able to provide some context for that. So first up, crystallography. I'm gonna skip over NMR because there haven't actually been that many uh, structures from NMR for SARS-CoV-2. And honestly, I'm not uh, particularly well-versed in NMR. So crystallography. So in, in crystallography, we take some x-rays, uh, we fire them at our crystal, and then we get a diffraction pattern uh, recorded on our detector. Uh, diffraction pattern should look, well, in an ideal world, will look something like this. Um, so these spots represent the internal uh, structure of our proteins. And what we do is we record these intensities, uh, convert them into amplitudes, and then what we need to do is uh, add in something called the phase. So once we've got our X-ray data converted to amplitudes, 
uh, we need to somehow calculate our phase, which I'm not going to go into because that's a whole lecture in itself, but assume we've got our phases. Uh, we combine our amplitudes and our phases, and that leads to our electron density map. Once we have our map, we can then build in our model into the map. And this doesn't have to be, well, it's very rarely an absolutely perfect fit. So you can see here this uh, tryptophan is actually, doesn't seem to have any density. Uh, there's also a little missing density in this um, in this backbone here and something's gone a bit awry down here as well. So the data are never perfect. Uh, so I, this is simulated perfect data from uh, the model. Um, but yeah, the, the reality is that we very rarely have a perfect fit for our structure to the data. So we have to sort of mitigate this in somehow, some way. So we use a, a method called an R factor. And this is effectively where we compare our observed data, uh, our observed um, structure factors from our data to our calculated structure factors from our model. Uh, so a typical R value for a small molecule, like a, a chemical crystallography project will be around 5%. So that's, that's very close to uh, a perfect fit. Uh, macro macromolecules, unfortunately, are much uh, much less perfect fits. So, for an experimental map uh, like we've got here, the R factor is about twenty point four. So, compared to our perfect uh, predicted map, so does my structure fit the data? Unfortunately, the answer is not really. But it's uh, we work with what we've got. So the other method, uh, cryo-electron microscopy, you fire a beam of electrons at uh, some uh, vitrified uh, proteins on a grid, and then you record the images that come off. So you get your micrographs uh, with all of your particles, you pick out your particles from these micrographs, and then you do sort of a 2D classification to find all the different orientations of your molecules and then do some 3D averaging to generate your map. Once you've got your map, you can then build your molecular model into the map in much the same way you'd, we showed with crystallography. And then hopefully that feeds into some scientific findings. So in both of these methods, uh, it's quite normal to find errors in structures. So it's a, it's a very complex problem. The, as we said earlier, the fit between the data and the model are not perfect. Uh, the, it's not yet possible to completely automate this process. Um, automation has come a very long way in the data processing in structural biology, but it still requires uh, human intervention a lot of the time to be able to fit our model into our, dens into our electron density. Uh, like I said, the models are mostly built manually. Um, so that also brings in human error, um, especially if you've got a, a non-expert working on building the structure. Um, and yeah, you need sort of expertise in many different aspects. Uh, so there's a lot of different types of software. There's a lot of uh, parameters to play with in all of that software. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not, an, not an easy problem to fix. So what we hope to do as the task force is uh, provide a pipeline. So we harvest our data from new PDB entries that come out every Wednesday, uh, as well as the uh, proteome and sequences and various other databases. And like I said, if we can get our hands on the raw data, uh, that's the, the best because we can do the whole thing from scratch. Um, then once we've harvested the data, we go into automatic evaluation. So there's a huge uh, variety of different uh, programs that we'll use to, to run through all of these uh, models and compare them to the data and see how well they fit. And if there's any sort of big outliers that kind of raises a red flag. And typically whenever we do get one of those red flags, uh, we'll manually reprocess uh, 
if we can uh, from the very start with the raw images, but if not, we'll do the best we can with the uh, model and the maps that are deposited in the protein data bank. Uh, and then once we've gone through the automatic and the manual evaluation, uh, we go on to dissemination. So we have a GitHub which hosts our database of all of our reprocess structures. Uh, we also post on Twitter, uh, 3D BioNotes, we put out 3D models. Um, I should also say when we do find a problem with a structure, we contact the author and try and uh, get it, get them to resubmit uh, a new a new version. Um, so yeah, so like an example of stuff that's come out of the automatic pipeline uh, from 999 depositions. Uh, yeah, there was various completeness problems, uh, high R, R freeze, uh, twinning, uh, all, all manner of sort of metrics that could lead to a potentially problematic model. Um, just got a couple of examples here. So this uh, zinc site not being modeled correctly, uh, this proline was in a trans state instead of a cis. Um, this uh, ligand sort of doesn't actually appear to be there. Uh, this glycosidic bond was uh, in the wrong orientation. And looking at this like Ramachandram map, you can see all manner of outliers present. Uh, so this is a, just a screenshot of our database. Um, so like I said, it's got a, you can filter it by the protein, the description of it, uh, and we give sort of the kind of standard statistics that you'd look at to find uh, a good model. Uh, we've also been writing reviews. So this is the first one that has been published uh, just recently. Uh, this focuses on NSP15, which is a lesser known protein, I would say. It's uh, not one vital to the life cycle, but it could still be interesting to someone somewhere. So yeah, there is a, a review on that if you would like to go and find it. Um, so as a summary, um, in order to understand the virus and its life cycle, we aim to understand its molecular biology, um, and we hope that this will help with the design of therapeutics. Uh, we've evaluated these structures with a bespoke pipeline, as well as expert knowledge, and we also hope to provide context uh, about the structural biology of the vi virus to identify research objectives. Um, you can read more about the task force in uh, this paper, uh, Making the Invisible Enemy Visible, uh, which is available online in open access. And then I'm just going to finish off with a little bit about the outreach that we've done. So we have a, a 3D printed version of the virus. Um, we've also been, like I say, posting on Twitter, making YouTube videos. Uh, I've live streamed some of my reprocessing uh, on Twitch. So you can see us working on the structures live. Um, we also have the coronavirus blog, which has yeah everything from uh, scientific discussions within structural biology to sort of more general public friendly uh, ones. Uh, this is just a picture of the 3D printed model. So this is a, a structurally accurate 3D printable file uh, for the coronavirus. So we've got the, the spikes and all the membrane proteins, um, which you can download and print yourself. Uh, it doesn't come painted. You will have to do that yourself. Um, so yeah, so that just leaves me to acknowledge the people that have helped us. Uh, so Thomas uh, Spletstoza, uh, who works at SciStyle.com. He's helped us with a lot of uh, the beautiful pictures of the coronavirus proteins. Uh, there's also the animation lab in the, at the University of Utah, uh, Gianluca Tomasello uh, from the 3D protein imaging, uh, dot com. He's also helped with a lot of figures for the reviews, as well as all the task force members and uh, Arwen Pearson in particular at the University of Hamburg. Um, so yeah, if you have uh, any anything you would like to talk to the task force about, you can contact contact uh, Andrea, uh, Andrea Thorne, uh, andrea.thorne at universityofhamburg.de. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening. 
big thank you to uh, Sam, um, who clearly kind of talk, uh, talked us through uh, the complexity of the data and actually the different layering of, of data that is required to, to make truly the structural biology uh, completely uh, open. Um, in that way. So next, uh, we will be turning uh, to uh, Professor Andrew Harrison. Um, professor Andrew Harrison is uh, a professor from the University of Edinburgh. He's a chemist as a background. He's evolved at a senior level at various large scale facilities across Europe, in particular the neutron source uh, in, in Grenoble, uh, where he was director of science and then uh, director general there, um, and then moved to Diamond some kind of nine, uh, nine years ago. And uh, Next, he will be leading the science programs for ELI, the extreme light uh, infrastructure um, in Hungary. And uh, Professor Harrison, you're here to uh, represent the LEAPS um, uh, collaboration. And um, if you don't mind, we'll just um, kind of like get you to, to talk a little bit about what LEAPS is all about. So LEAPS is the League of European Accelerator-based uh, Photon Sources. Um, and just tell us a little bit about LEAPS and why uh, that group of people is, is really important. Th thanks, Isabel. Pleasure to be on, on here and, and have the chance to talk, talk about LEAPS. So yeah, LEAPS um, brings together every single accelerator-based light source in Europe, all the synchrotrons, all the free electron lasers. It started about six years ago, um, driven primarily by the belief that together we can be much more effective in developing technology, in sharing best practice, and also um, uh, representing um, the strengths of, of the of the science that we support and so forth. So a, a group that can speak as one voice to policymakers and, and funders. Um, and in that time, I, I guess among the key achievements have been to develop a coherent roadmap as to how we ought to develop across Europe. You know, we, we generally tend to do this individually um, and we tend to do very similar things when we develop roadmaps. You know, what, what are the scientific objectives? How we meet, do we meet them, and so forth? And that process has been speeded up and made far more ro far more robust by sharing information across facilities. And then when it comes to talking to, um, let's say, the European Commission, again, we can speak with one coherent voice about um, the, the technological needs that we might wish to develop um, about influencing um, uh, decisions on funding programs and so forth rather than the commission or for that matter any other policymaker having to go out and talk to all, all the members um, individually um, so you know before we might have had bilateral trilateral whatever um, uh, relationships um, and now um, that whole process of uh, developing policy and so forth has, has been speeded up and probably the, the other significant area has been in that of data, data and computation. Again, we're all trying to do very similar things, developing the tools, sharing the tools, ensuring the data we produce is widely accessible, um, uh, making sure the protocols for access and so forth are coherent. And it's a perfect example of where we should all be trying to do absolutely the very same thing. And I guess it's not just a, a European problem. Uh, I think also you've got the, the community, I think, represented by Lightsources.org um, and Lens, uh, who are the, the kind of global voices uh, for these two photon and neutron uh, communities that are, are, are kind of linking up there. Can you tell us a little bit about that, that global challenge in that sense? Well, and, and yes, you're absolutely right. It, this isn't just a, a European um, challenge and European need. Um, of course, it was developed first and foremost amongst ourselves within Europe because we're the closest neighbours and we we naturally meet at all sorts of fora set up um, uh, by the science community in, in Europe. But this is, a, as you say, absolutely, Isabel, it's a global challenge. Uh, and there too, we've also been joining up. So Light Sources is a is a great example of, uh, of an organisation that, again, provides um, a forum for discussion, a platform uh, for sharing best practice and, and presenting and so forth. Um, and in the pandemic, uh, we found that that provided a really good, effective vehicle for sharing best practice, sharing early information. We've seen from the, the presentations just now um, the necessity to um, share information uh, as soon and as accurately as possible. Uh, and I think both those things are important. It's, it's, it's the speed of sharing the information, but it's also ensuring that when the information is shared, um, it's shared in a, in a manner that well, it, it, that we can trust that 
that information to be reliable. And again, organizations like lightsys.org have provided a means um, to, to ensure that we work together, not only quickly, um, but coherently. You touched and, on Len, uh, Lens and, and Lens org as well. Yeah, um, well, Len, Lens, Lens is the sort of the and, neutron equivalent. Yes, um, and, and they have they have a global voice as well in neutron.org, I think. Yeah. Um, so yes, there's exactly the the kind of similar approach for the neutron community, uh, which is very important as well. Um, just going back to to Dr. Perry's uh, presentation at the very beginning, where he he kind of talked about how great it was to have all the data kind of open um, at the early stage, but then kind of shared a little bit of the challenges on the IP for this kind of the second part. I, I thought um, it would be interesting for the audience to hear a little bit about uh, the challenges from your perspective for large scale facilities to make that early part, uh, just that, 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 that very early part of the data um, available in, a, in, a, in an open way and in a, in a fair way. How, how, oh, yeah, can yeah. you just express a little bit some of the challenges there? Because yeah. I mean, multi, multiple, multiple challenges. Um, I'd say actually, so there are cultural challenges mm -hmm. um, uh, and there are technical challenges here. And the technical challenges are both software and hardware. So let's just start with the cultural one. Um, so, you know, what we saw in those, I'd say all three presentations were great examples of the scientific community acting in, I would say, an unprecedentedly open way. Um, and that's actually very much against the normal instincts of, of, of scientists who who you know we, scientists tend to be rewarded for having great ideas and exploiting them first you know to be the first person to think of and have published such and such a finding um so ownership is always um an important aspect of of data um and and scientific discovery um what we saw of course with covid was that was you know was research driven by very altruistic uh, needs a lot of the time the, the, the you know the overwhelming belief that this was a global problem that had to be met globally and we should be sharing all of this stuff mm. but but you know the traditional model is for scientists to beaver away in their own on their own or with their own groups and be the first to discover something and plant their flag and say look aren't we clever um uh so so there's this issue about early sharing um whilst making sure that credit is um given to and maintained by the people who have contributed so i i think and i think that is a very real challenge you if people are to be open about it they need to feel that along the way their contribution will be will be recognized um and then secondly there are technical challenges um you know if we are to share data then it should adhere to the the so-called fair principles um and I, I can never always remember what fai stand for you uh, might have probably fi there, find, findable. findable uh adaptable and uh, uh interoperable, interoperable and, and reusable exactly uh, we missed one maybe uh, the <laughs> no, audience can tell us if we've missed one <laughs> <laughs> but, but i think the point is that you know if you are to share data i think we all need to share it in a manner um that's consistent uh, that we you know we know where that, that, that it, it can be accessible in a, a standard way and it can be reused readily um so so we have to agree on those protocols and again that there has been you know it, and again it's sort of people are often attached to the way that they've done this and they've invested a lot of time to set up their own systems um so to move towards common standards yeah. will mean some people changing um letting go of things that they have held dear um mm. but again I, I think we absolutely have to get to to one set of agreed mm. protocols um and then there's just the sheer volume and complexity i mean we saw this in the um, in, this, mm. in claire's talk the second talk mm. with that organ uh, um, the human organ at atlas i mean those data sets are absolutely you know, 1.5 terabytes i think she said for you know a complex image of an organ um, bigger than your average portable hard drive and the idea that that data can be rapidly moved around and accessed and mm. visualized and, and interrogated and processed means that um you actually you have to have very substantial hardware in place mm. we're, we're starting to get to the point where the amounts of data that synchrotrons produce are comparable to those of high energy physics facilities like cern um mm. and with that come tremendous problems mm. about mm. storing uh, and mm. accessing the data mm. um and mm. then to the, you know, the visualization is is non-trivial um you need to have some really powerful hardware in some cases to actually be able to dig down and manipulate uh, manipulate those images um so 
I, th I think that's a, a very real, ch you know, so the, the human organ atlas is, I think is a wonderful project, but can you imagine as that really takes root and produces yeah. huge quantities of data that people want to interrogate, we really have to think about where it's kept and how yes. it's made accessible. I think there's a key question around infrastructure there. Um, you 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 mentioned about um, obviously the, the 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 large volume. I think maybe for the audience, um, just to reiterate the breadth of applications of these photon and neutron source. So we are not just talking about um, these three examples that we've no. just heard about. Um, so do you want to take us through a little bit of of uh, really that breadth that is there in in terms of the science and and how challenging the whole cultural and technical aspect is within that context yes certainly so you know fun fundamentally what these facilities allow us to do is to look at the structure of materials down to the individual atoms or put another way you know from the structure from individual atoms all the way out to macroscopic objects you can actually you know millimeters centimeters and so forth um and if you if you wish to understand uh how materials work and how to be able to develop them, that is actually the bedrock. Where are the atoms um, and how do they interact to give the material its, its property? Uh, and we saw that, in, of course, in coronavirus, very topical, um, but of course it, it reaches into all areas of structural biology, for example. If you want to tackle disease, then one of the key pieces of information is to understand the molecular origin of disease, and then you can go and mm -hmm. devise uh, molecules or drugs to tackle that. Um, but exactly the same principles are needed if we want to develop new materials for um, batteries or photovoltaic cells. Again, you need to know where are the atoms in the... So you take a battery, for example, why do lithium batteries fail? Well, as you cycle them, the lithium in the cell um, uh, gets transformed to lithium metal, and it, shorts, it can short circuit the cell. And to understand that, you need to be able to look at um, batteries at an atomic level as they are being cycled. Um, and that's actually one of the, the real successes in the last 10 or 20 years. These facilities um, uh, have been incredibly useful for decades to look at static structures, you know, the structure of DNA. Um, uh, for example, the, you know, the famous photograph of Rosalind Franklin, which was, which was then gave, gave us our first um, uh, direct information about the how the genetic code is passed on. Um, nowadays, we can look at structures like that actually as um, the material is in a system that's being that's being being used. The, the cycling battery, the materials that are being deposited in advanced manufacturing processes, and so forth. Um, so we've touched on life sciences, um, uh, materials for advanced technologies, but actually all the way across into into archaeology. You know, if you want to understand how our um, predecessors uh, fabricated tools, um, or if you want to unearth, well, I mean, we just heard, I think, this week of uh, a new Van Gogh being discovered underneath the, the, mm. the paint of you know, what we what we see as a painting, then these tools also allow us to look below the surface to interrogate um, the materials of which um, artifacts were made, and also tells us about how to preserve them. So, mm -hmm. yeah, structural biology, drug discovery, uh, high tech materials, all the way across to um, uh, to mm -hmm. cultural mm -hmm. heritage mm -hmm. and, and and archaeology. Yeah. And, and in quite in high numbers. I mean, I, th I seem to recall the, the the last tally of of the user communities uh, was a, around twenty five thousand uh, researchers. Um, um, so. We, we, the task is is huge, and right. and with uh, you know it's it's a, maybe a kind of a typical uh, uh, scientific approach. With with a huge problem, you have to decouple that into smaller nuggets of 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 things. And I think what was good in the three talks that we had is that that attempt to tackle one particular area and then try to 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 kind of like do what you can for that that particular. Um, uh, area of science, um, you know, I'm just thinking about the organ atlas is is a great initiative, and it will grow, and it will. It's but it's very focused on 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 a particular technique and a particular um, health application. But you could have that reproduced for all the museums worldwide who have their collections in high resolution, for instance. I mean, we know we've had interest from the Natural History Museum here in the United Kingdom um, for um, oh. having beetles kind of measured yeah. up but you can see how this idea can actually permeate other disciplines as a result uh, uh, but obviously you, you can only do one thing uh, at a time um which is uh, which is really important that we don't to just spread ourselves uh, to, a little bit too thinly there um 
Mm-hmm. Carry so, on. I, I was just going to, but th- yeah, there, you can harness, mm-hmm. there you can harness the, the wider scientific community. So as long as these people um, are aware of and can appreciate the power of these t- tools in their own work, mm-hmm. um, once they're converted, they tend to go away and uh, and exploit these tools themselves. The, the key thing is the outreach, isn't it? Is 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 making people aware of the power of these tools mm-hmm. and also give them the initial training because mm-hmm. people come in um, without necessarily yeah. being able to um, take the data or process or whatever. But once you've t- gone yeah. through that step of outreach and training, then away they go and they just mm-hmm. <laughs> they exploit mm-hmm. these these tools yes. for themselves. Very good. Um, I'll start weaving in some of the questions from the audience, if you don't mind, Andrew. But sure. um, um, obviously, there's been a lot of talk about the European Open Science Cloud, EOSC. Um, and um, we've been, obviously, uh, as Expands and Panosk are, are kind of laying the foundation for the open data at Photon and Neutron Source. What, what do you do you see uh, a plan to integrate everything that we are doing under EOSC? I think maybe we should start with just the basic question, what is EOSC and actually oh what is the ambition of EOSC? <laughs> because in that way, we've just been touching on those themes of if EOSC is an infrastructure, then technically they could help deliver what we've just been talking about. Yeah. Or if they are just um, an umbrella uh, of, of um, you know, it really depends what EOSC's ambition is all about, I think, on that question. So I don't know, Daniel, you might want to uh, to think about um, what you'd like EOSC uh, to be, because I think that would help us almost to actually paint the, the possibilities of these things being plugged into EOSC. So, so Isabel, I, I, you probably not picked the right person to to expound on on, on EOSC. Um, uh, I, I'm only sort of tangentially aware of it. Of course, you know, it, it's involved in 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 providing the framework within which we will operate. Um, for example, encouraging setting up those protocols. Um, where, but but of course, there is the, the 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 very substantial problem about how you provide the compute power, mm-hmm. and at the moment, that's very much um, funded through national. Um, uh, initiatives yeah. i think the trick is really to try to join up to confederate the national mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. I- initiatives and again a lot of that comes down to ensure that they're interoperable that w- when you um take data it can be moved across mm-hmm. platforms and the 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 software tools that you develop to act to to, mm-hmm. to um to exploit that data is, mm-hmm. is again operable um seamlessly aclo- across those platforms um uh, how far it has got with that, I'm, I'm, I'm really not the person yeah. to ask, but I think the ultimate ambition to join national initiatives um, and make it one whole uh, across Europe is, is, is absolutely essential. Absolutely. And I think it goes also beyond Europe because we've talked about these problems are, are global. Yes, but I think it'd be, it'd be lovely to see EOSC being the leader in, in, in that way, in providing you know, the infrastructure to, to deliver uh, to deliver those services really to uh, the user communities. But I think there, um, I don't know if you'll agree, Andrew, but I think there's a lot of challenge on on the breadth of science that we've just talked about and the finances that will be required and which one needs to be prioritized over another. You know, there's a prioritization exercise that will be required around uh, making that infrastructure a reality. Yeah, um, I mean, I mean, Clearly, the resources required to store and process data are, are, are potentially vast, and we can't do everything mm. um, at once. Um, I mean, for, fortunately, however, it comes back to the point I tried to make earlier, that the measurements we take, in a sense, are generic. They involve looking at structure, primarily looking at structure down to atomic levels. So, um, so there is a commonality in the nature of the data and many of the processing tools that we might need. I'm just sticking with mm-hmm. synchrotrons and, and mm. um, fells for the moment. Um, so I, I think actually where where you have a potentially vast user base, um, it won't where, where the selection criterion usually is based on excellence of science, access to that data. Um, I think we will continue to use that as 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 the means, if you like, of prioritizing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh who gets access and, and and so forth so um but but nevertheless i think we you know we, we we're getting to the point where 
the resource required to do this is beyond our individual budgets. Um, mm. it, it used to be the case that people came to take data from large machines like this, and they just they just took it away from them initially on a floppy disk and then a, a, a CD and, and increasingly hard drives. Um, we're at the point where that's no longer viable. Mm. Um, they they can't just go back to their universities and process it. We're having to centralize the way in which this is done, and it mm. it is becoming the responsibility of the large facilities mm, um, yeah. to do this, just as you have the sort of yeah, various tier yeah. level computing, the high energy yeah, physics and yeah. so forth. And um, the question about who pays for it um, has been posed, but it hasn't yet been been answered. Mm. So so when you look at the future of these machines, you know, Diamond is going through mm. an upgrade mm. at the moment. Um, that upgrade is pointless, mm. um, or rather it's, it's poised to go through an upgrade. Uh, that upgrade is pointless unless you put in place the complementary compute um, mm. Uh, facilities and the resource required for that is also immense. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I think um, from uh, Daniel's, uh, so Daniel kind of asked us if there are plans to integrate what, what we've just presented. Uh, the answer is yes. yes. I think what, what we have done with uh, Expands and Panosk has been to develop um, uh, really search APIs into some of the catalogs that we've just seen and create a feed to be to find, which is already um, a kind of a, uh, an e run service. Um, so there, there is that um, happening at the moment. But I think where we need to be, and, and I think you touched on that, Andrew, uh, with the tomography community, where we, you have huge volume volumes of data um, that are uh, being uh, made uh, open, you need to ask yourself before you make them open, you know, what is useful for the user community? Is it is it the raw data in terms of yes. uh, the, the single scans? Is it the reconstruction? Is it going to be, in this case uh, of tomography, is it going to be uh, maybe more thinking of reducing the data to make it more uh, manageable? So I think there are a lot of big uh, both technical and cultural questions uh, to to be asked about that. Um, do you want yeah, to yeah, on, on that? Yeah. I mean, I mean Claire, Claire's presentation was fascinating because she she shared with us these beautiful three D images. But mm. you know, behind each of those, mm. there's a vast amount of compute power. And as you say, there's a there's a there's a very very big raw data set which is then transformed um, in a very compute intensive way to mm. to produce these images um, and. And again, there are, there are a number of challenges there. One is that you know the, the time taken to do that transformation. Um, it looked you know it looked lovely and tempting in, the, in those <laughs> images we saw on on, on the screen, um, but there is a huge amount of of number crunching that goes into that. And then, as you say, once you've got that transformed image, is is that is that the prize? Is that the 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 goal? Um, to, for many people, it is. But just supposing you you discovered an error in the in the in the um, you know, have, heaven forbid, but you know, an error or a better way of processing it, um, you'd want to go back to the raw data. But if the raw data sets are so vast that it's very difficult to store them indefinitely, um, uh, then you know you, you have to make a decision about which you know what data you keep. Um, and, and when you go taking the case of high energy physics again, you know, the data sets in high energy physics. Um, the raw data is 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 absolutely vast, um, but there are ways of choosing which bits of data to keep and which 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 to reject. And I think it's only one part in um, many billions of of you know uh, bits of data that's kept. Um, do we continue to do what we do at the moment, which is 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 keep every single pixel? Um, uh, which is is the case, I think, for pretty much all synchrons. Or do we say, as these data gets, sets get too vast, actually, once it's been transformed into the manner that we we, we believe we wish to use it, mm -hmm. we discard the raw data and, and we move on. Uh, th these are all really important questions. Mm -hmm. Mm. And um, so I don't know if the audience has got any more questions, so I, I do encourage people to raise their hand or, or, or carry on uh, putting it in the chat. No problem, I can read them out for you. Um, but from my perspective, just exploring what the next steps are going to be with you for a minute, Andrew. You mentioned the cultural challenges, the, the technical challenges. I think um, if I may kind of comment on, on Expands and Panos, uh, they've been two very pivotal grounds, really, yeah. to, to get us 
um, kind of from a European uh, uh, facilities perspective, to culturally start breaking down the barriers, because it is not a faint task to engage with, I think, the 25,000 users that, that we've just uh, mentioned about, the, that was the latest tally of, of all the, the, the user community, and, uh, and make sure that you get, bring them on board with that idea yes. of, of making data open. That, that is not a, 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 a small task. And I think Expand and Panos did quite a lot of a very groundwork, laying the foundation with the user community, and hopefully we'll finish that work uh, very nicely uh, by the time that the grants um, finish. Um, but beyond that, they also started looking at the technical challenges and looking at the, the, the kind of what they could actually make available in terms of the different pipelines. But in terms of the next steps, I think, what, what would you say we need to think about? I, I, well, I, I think the key future challenges are the sheer scale of resource required to store and manipulate data. Um, as as these facilities get brighter, the amount of data that they produce is is just rising. I, I hesitate to say exponentially because that implies a certain relationship, but but at a frightening speed, and at a speed where the compute uh, the data storage and compute power is not obviously going to scale to keep up with it. Um, and that requires, I think, really quite radical ways um, of making choices about, uh, come back to what I said earlier, which bits of data do we keep? Um, because to continue to store every single pixel and to wish to transform the data associated with every single pixel at the moment doesn't look scalable so we're going to have to develop technology to make the detector smarter that point out you know this pixel mm -hmm. has got useful information this this doesn't for example mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're going to probably have to develop uh, much more powerful algorithms possibly based on, on on ai to to accelerate the transformation of the data um mm -hmm. and in particular and he, here's a real challenge um you know when when someone's performing an experiment it's important that they understand what they're looking at in close to real time. Mm. You don't want them to take data blind and then three months later when they've transformed it going, oh goodness, wouldn't it be good to make mm. another sort of measurement following that? So these tools also have to be powerful enough to allow the experimentalist to visualize, to understand what they're seeing in, in, in real time um, so they can make informed decisions about what to measure next. So I think, the central mm. challenge is the scaling up mm. of the resource required to visualize and transform the data. And that probably needs also for us to get smarter about the data that we keep and the data that we process. Um, mm. And at the moment, um, and you know, some of that will be solved in principle by investing in, in bigger computers, um, but you know, this is this is a very expensive process, and it's mm -hmm. also in, let's not forget too that compute means um, compute power is associated still with increased carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. um, and we, when we look at these big machines for science, mm -hmm. yes, they cost an awful lot of energy to run, um, but increasingly the lion's share of the the energy cost of running these facilities mm -hmm. is actually in the compute power. Mm -hmm. So I think again we've got to think really hard. Yeah. about how we control that um, and, and, and keep that aspect of the delivery of science to a minimum. Mm. Very good. I, I, I completely um, uh, agree. I think that scaling element is, is really huge. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking kind of creatively as, as you were talking. Um, I mean, from, from that kind of scaling perspective, we, we've got a huge um, lesson to learn from the high energy physics there. Because, I mean, uh, I think, correct me, yes. the audience can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think the likes of uh, CERN do churn out about 150 petabytes a year of data. So they are the kind of like the, I think the experts in, in that kind of high level, huge amount of data uh, coming through. I think the synchrotrons, the light sources community alone represent just only about 10% of that per year. But as you said, on an exponential or, or not yeah. quite exponential track there. But 
uh, for me, there's a lot of best practice maybe next that could be explored uh, between the two um, as to how do they do their data reduction? How do they go about um, manipulating and revisiting the data? Um, and I think specific programs based on what you've said around the data reduction seems to be absolutely a priority for the range of communities. So not only just the tomography community, obviously because they are the heaviest data community, uh, but looking at the crystallography, the pandemic preparedness uh, uh, work that we've just seen, all of that needs to be kind of um, almost looked at with the lens of data reduction. Uh, straight away and there should be really initiatives to to underpin that uh, next um uh, yeah one of the great successes of CERN is that it's a global coordinated yeah. effort isn't it in data yeah. reduction with the tier system and so forth i'm by no means an expert but but it comes yeah. down to let's have agreed standards and let's work together mm. on developing mm. common tools to 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 handle and the that, data we're producing and i think you said the word standards i think standards are are critical so far I don't think there's been a lot of involvement of the international standards labs into the conversation of the digital agenda, no. and actually there should be there should be more. So that could be a, a third strand to 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 the future future steps there. Yes, absolutely. We, we, we've we've sort of at the moment we're essentially self regulating. We're doing this ourselves, but but mm. you know, mm. um, and and the, the feeling is that you, you bring all the synchrotrons together. That's a substantial community, but these very same. Uh, challenges are also being discussed in other um, collections mm -hmm. of infrastructures and so forth. And they have essentially the same generic mm -hmm. problems when yeah. it comes to standardization. Very good. So I think, thank you, Andrew, for, for your input. I think uh, I'll thank also the audience. I, unless there are any more questions uh, coming through, uh, if people want to raise hands, as I said, uh, please do so. This is your final uh, final call. Um, otherwise, I'll say uh, thank you very much to Andrew. Thank you to obviously Thanks. our pre-recorded uh, scientists that took the time to to present their work. And uh, we're looking forward to really the next steps, uh, as we've just discussed. You know, um, it's there's huge challenges. I think what is very comforting is to to think of uh, the Dr. Claire Walsh, uh, the Dr. Sam Howell, and uh, Dr. Ben. Perry out there that are actually working actively to make some of what we've just talked on the policy side uh, a reality on the ground and how we can really help them uh, moving forward. Uh, I think uh, it's been interesting to see these kind of uh, next uh, pipelines that, that could come, come online. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. And I hope you have a good day and a good session at ESOF next. Thank you very much. Thanks, Isabel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.